Take it away, Kirsten. All right, thank you. My name is Kirsten Mayer. I'm a PhD student at the Department of Atmospheric Science at CSU. I'm going to be talking about utilizing interpretable neural networks for subseasonal prediction. While I'm applying it to subseasonal prediction, we can, we can really apply all these um, tools that we're using here for any type of prediction problem. I'd also like to uh, mention my advisor who's been working on this with me and also my funding from the MSF. So first I'm gonna talk about uh, what subseasonal means. Subseasonal timescales are these two to five week timescales. So subseasonal prediction is prediction on these two to five weeks. So here I have a schematic of prediction scale on the y-axis and a week and a time on the x-axis. So I have hour, day, and weeks marked. So as you can see, when we're at weather time scales, so these hour, day predictions, we can see these really high prediction scales. But as we approach a week, we can see this stark, stark decrease in prediction scale. And this is due to minor, minor errors in initial conditions of our models that can lead to chaotic growth over time. You can think about this as the butterfly effect. You've all experienced the fact that we don't have very good prediction scale on those time scales. For example, if you were planning a picnic, uh, you would probably trust the weather forecast an hour out or to a day out and whether it's going to rain. But on these two to five week time scales, let's say you're planning a picnic for a month out, I doubt many of you would use the actual prediction for um, how, where you should have your picnic. So in order to predict on these two to five week time scales or these sub-seasonal time scales, we look towards forecasts of opportunity where certain conditions can lead to more predictable behaviors than others. So beyond these weather time scales, these days and days and hours, we must look for specific states of the earth system or these opportunities that lead to enhanced predictable behavior. One of these opportunities is known as the Madden-Julian oscillation for subseasonal prediction. The Madden-Julian oscillation is a um, dipole of suppressed uh, convection or precipitation and, a, and another of enhanced precipitation where the teal indicates regions of enhanced precipitation or you can think of a really cloudy region and the uh, tan indicates a really sunny region compared to normal. So when the MJO is active, we can use information about where it's located and how strong it is to predict what will happen over the, the Northern Hemisphere, such as North America um, and the Atlantic. But the MJO isn't always active. And this is where the idea of opportunities comes in. Sometimes when the MJO isn't active, you can think of the tropics as a bunch of small ripples or a bunch of uh, storms that are occurring. And this is a pretty chaotic system and it makes it very difficult for us to predict how the ripples will end up affecting us over the Northern Hemisphere. But when the MJO is active, you can think of it as one large ripple where these, this ripple propagates into the Northern Hemisphere and can start impacting our weather. And there's been studies to show that the MJO leads to consistent and coherent weather patterns over the United States. So when the MJO is active, we can use the information about the state of the MJO to predict what will happen to weather in the United States and North Atlantic in Europe. So where do neural networks come in? How can we use neural networks for subseasonal predictions? So the question we're trying to ask is how can we utilize neural networks to identify forecasts of opportunity for subseasonal prediction. So in order to do this, we need to answer two questions. So can neural networks identify the forecast of opportunity for subseasonal prediction? Well, they'll need to be able to identify when. When do we see periods of enhanced predictability or when are these opportunities? And the second is why. Why is there predictability and where is it coming from? So in order to orient us, I, I've made the neural network set up on the slide for the subseasonal prediction where we input tropical storminess. So again, where this teal color indicates enhanced uh, rain and this tan color indicates um, suppressed rain or very sunny weather. And we input all days. So we input days where the MJO is not active and days where the MJO is active. And we wanna see if it can pick out these opportunities. We input individual days into our hidden layer to train it. Um, and we just use one layer and it's a very simple network. 
And we're trying to get this network to predict the circulation over the North Atlantic three weeks later, the sign of the circulation. You may be wondering why we're looking at the North Atlantic um, since it's over the ocean and no one lives there. Well, this is because um, this is a, a region where storms are generated and steered into Europe and are very important for forecasting um, European weather. So the first question we're gonna try to figure out how to answer with a neural network is when. When do we see these periods of enhanced predictability? Well, we use an idea called model confidence where we use the softmax activation function to convert our output from the neural network into something like a probability, which we call confidence. So the neural network outputs some numbers, some random numbers. And let's say we have a three and a one. So the neural network is predicting the sign of the circulation over the North Atlantic is going to be positive. Now we can run that through the softmax activation function and it'll pop out a probability or what we refer to as a confidence where the model's 88% confident that its correction is, uh, is correct. So how can we use model confidence as a forecast of opportunity? Well, if we start looking at neural network confidence thresholds, we can uh, compare the accuracies at different levels. So for example, when the neural network confidence threshold is low, we can see that we have an accuracy around 60%. But as we increase this neural network confidence threshold, so as the model becomes more and more confident in its predictions, you can see the stark increase up to about 72% accuracy. So as this confidence threshold increases, our accuracy increases, which suggests the model is finding these forecasts of opportunity. And we would expect this since we, we know as domain scientists that the MJO is a thing for subseasonal prediction. And so while the number of predictions go down, we have, while we increase our neural network confidence, we found these, num these opportunities to um, have higher predictions go. So in order to make sure that this wasn't just a fluke on one model, we actually trained um, this model 100 different times with random initialized weights. And we wanted to see how the accuracy changed with when we look at no confidence whatsoever, and when we actually look at the 10% most confident predictions. So when we're ignoring confidence and we just look at all the predictions, you can see that um, the accuracy is around 57%. But when we look at the 10% most confident predictions from each model, we can see a stark increase in the, um, in the model accuracy up to about 67% for all these 100 models. So to go back to the question, when, when do we see periods of enhanced predictability and how can neural networks pick this out? We can really look at model confidence in order, in order to determine these forecasts of opportunity. So next I'm gonna talk about why. Why is there predictability? Because this is really the science question. This is what we're trying to get at. Where is this predictability coming from and how can we use this for forecasts in the future? So of course we use layer-wise relevance propagation, which is our favorite tool or LRP. And we're basically asking, what did the model learn? So in this case, we're asking, what are the relevant physical structures of storminess or the, the storms in the tropics that lead to prediction, enhanced prediction scale over the North Atlantic three weeks later. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about what layer-wise relevance propagation is again. This example was just given, um, but let's say we have a neural network that's trying to decide whether an image is a cat or a dog. Well, you input the image into a trained neural network and it pops out a prediction of whether it thinks it's a cat or a dog. Let's say it was a correct prediction of a cat. And we can tell that this is a cat. So we can go back through our trained neural network, uncover what's in, inside the black box, and trace back and create a heat map of what the neural network actually looked at to determine that this picture was a cat. And so you can see that um, it's picked out some ears, maybe the nose, um, some eyes, etc. So you can also do this for other things like a hammerhead shark, of course. Um, and you can see that for the hammerhead shark, it's picked out the hammerhead shape and, and fins in order to determine this. But you can also do this for objects. You don't have to do this on animals per se. 
Um, so here's an example of a coffee cup and the neural network determined it was a coffee cup because of the rim mainly, but then also if you can see this, it has um, the handle outlined and the base of the coffee cup. And the most common example that's used for LRP is handwritten numbers where the neural network can pick out what regions were important to identify that these were the certain numbers. So um, how do we apply layer-wise relevance propagation to S2S prediction? So our, we input tropical storminess into a hidden layer and try to guess the sign of the circulation three weeks later. So when we're using layer-wise relevance propagation, we want to take these correct predictions of circulation, the sign of the circulation over the North Atlantic and ask what the tropics was doing three weeks earlier. So what are these relevant physical structures of storminess in the tropics? Or what do the tropics look like for accurate predictions over the North Atlantic? So now we're looking at heat maps of the storminess over the uh, tropics that was important for these predictions over the North Atlantic. And as you can see, we have these two hot spots of heat maps. Oops. Um, hot spots of hot spots where we have one over the maritime continent and one over the Western Pacific. And if you actually composite on these days, you can see that this is a region of um, enhanced sun where it's very dry. And this is a region of enhanced precipitation. And so it's actually picking out um, what's something that looks like MJO phase seven and eight, which we know can impact. Our, our prediction skill over the North Atlantic. But we can also do this for different time scales. Let's say we want to predict two weeks out instead of three weeks out. So what did the tropics look two weeks before we made our prediction over the North Atlantic? Well, again, you can see these two hot spots, one over the maritime continent and one over the Western Pacific. But we also see these features that are not typically MJO-like, like this, uh, a uh, hot spot that propagates into the Northern Hemisphere a little further. And then we also have these hot spots over Northern India and Pakistan and in the Middle East. So in order to understand these more, we use uh, clustering. And what's super nice about LRP is that you can have individual LRP maps for each prediction. So for each prediction that is correct, you can actually figure out what the model looked at for that specific prediction to determine that um, this was the correct sign. So we use clustering, which is, uh, we use k-mean clustering, and we decided to group into two groups to see what the neural network is picking out. Um, and when we do this, our first group is really showing a, this dipole, this, um, these two regions of hotspots, one over the maritime continent and one over the Western Pacific. And we can see when we look at the actual storminess during these times that there is enhanced precipitation over the maritime continent and it's sunny over the Western Pacific, and this may be associated with MJO phase two and three. So it's again, it's picking out this MJO signal. But what's really interesting is in the second group, it's picked out these not MJO-like signals. And so these may be new forecasts of opportunity that we've never seen before that's provided by um, looking at LRP. So we also did this for week three, but you can, as you can see that these are very similar. We have the the two hot spots, one over the maritime continent and one over the Western Pacific for both of these. So clustering can be a useful tool for identifying one or more forecasts of opportunity and some that we may not even know. So how we answer the question, why? Why is the predictability? Where is it coming from? We can use layer-wise relevance propagation to do this, to look for these forecasts of opportunity. So we can use neural networks to further understand subseasonal prediction. But like I said at the beginning, this isn't just for subseasonal timescales or for atmospheric science. If you're doing any type of prediction that uses forecasts of opportunities, this could be a great tool where model confidence can identify these opportunities for increased accuracy and layer-wise relevance propagation can open this black box that we consider a neural network. So we can learn how the network has made its prediction. This allows us to do the science that we're interested in. We can find new sources of predictability from extracting knowledge from the actual neural network. If you're curious and wanna know more about this, you can look at these um, 
uh, papers. Otherwise, you can send me an email. I'm also on Twitter. Hey, Kirsten. So in terms of questions before we move on, um, one question is, can you think of possible ways to measure uncertainty of your heat maps? Totally. So there's actually a new method from, LR, um, from the LRP group. And I haven't looked into it yet, but that's one of our next steps in terms of measuring the uncertainty of our heat maps. Great, thank you. Um, I guess with that, we can move on. And again, we will be taking questions for the whole panel. We can talk about LRP and all the other cool tools we're going to hear about next um, at the end of this session.